welcome to this, the eighth installment in my series of conversations to distill wisdom amid the COVID-19 pandemic. The wisdom we will be distilling is not so much about the virus and the body today, but whether the pandemic within society has precipitated more wisdom to enable us to grapple with all the other messy and wicked problems that existed before COVID-19 came along and which are now resurfacing on the national and global agenda as the economy opens up and people go back to work if they're still lucky to have a job. In South Africa, the COVID-19 virus arrived while we were still trying to throw off the grave clothes of state capture. And I was rather hoping that it would paradoxically serve as a kind of tonic to humble politicians and unify society around a common priority and transcend those polarizing contestations for power by corrupted, partisan and populist political parties. I really did believe that as we learned our way into bringing the pandemic under control, we would have overall been toughened up, particularly the minds of the scientists, and tenderized the hearts of everyone. Social workers are trained to have an eye for the potential of enhanced social functioning that crises bring at the individual, family and community level and I was genuinely hoping it would leave us more capable and with insight to better grapple with all those messy and wicked systemic crises that, that pre-existed COVID at the national and international level. Racism and prejudice, widening economic inequality increasing risk and vulnerability due to global climate change and ecosystem destruction. So, how has the COVID crisis changed the discourse on race, economics, environment, politics and power? Well, today I've invited five of my friends to have a roundtable dialogue using those five words. And it turns out to produce a rather useful acronym, REAP which of course brings to mind the warnings of the prophet Hosea, for they have sown the wind and shall reap the whirlwind, which actually occurs to me as a rather apt analogy for climate change. Well, we sow a wind by having extracted fossil fuels from the crust of the earth. We burn them, put them into the atmosphere and accelerate the natural carbon cycle, which, which then in turn alters global weather patterns and produces whirlwinds of destruction which then affect all the other natural cycles of nature that cause suffering and disproportionately the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. A situation that defeats the policies of even the most well-meaning political leaders and the best programs of the humanitarian agencies. But while climate change was not what the prophet Hosea had in mind, the point is that small things can have big consequences. A tiny microscopic virus jumps the species barrier and the entire human society goes into lockdown. So what good seeds now need to be sown in the churned up soils that COVID has ploughed up in society? Well, this is a bumper version and to give my friends enough time to explore the wicked issues, it's going to be longer than the normal hour. So budget up to two hours and bear with me with this long introduction but there's a very important backstory to tell you, and if you want to fast forward over it, if you've heard it before. But when you hear the wisdom of my guests, I'm sure you won't want the conversation to end. Because I have such an interesting and diverse group of insightful people surrounding me here on the screen. And by the way, if you're not aware of it, YouTube does have a setting that allows you to speed up the playback without us having to all sound like chipmunks. So do that if the pace is too slow for you, because I'm not going to have time to do much trimming down as I normally do. Okay, well here's a backstory of how these tough minds and tender hearts came together. And credit must go to that well-known radio and print journalist, Stephen Grotes. He is the anchor of the SABC Sunrise News and Current Affairs program on SAFM and every morning when my radio alarm switches on at about 6am I get stirred from my slumbers by Stephen's cheerful voice. Now one of his strap lines happens to be continuing the conversation. Well this episode continues the conversations that he has had with no less than four of my friends over the past two weeks and people who have become part of my social ecosystem of support in my work. 
it all started last week on Monday when Stephen introduced Gwen and Gwenya to reflect on the DA policy conference that had just finished over the weekend. And after her, he had Professor Somodora for Kenny. All day long. 13 after 7 the time. Good morning. The Democratic Alliance held its, vir its policy conference virtually over the weekend. It's adopted several policy platforms, particularly around the economy and how to reduce poverty. But the main issue around the party still appears to be the issue of race based redress. It says it's now adopted a policy of non-racialism, which means people will not be treated differently because of their race. What I'm presuming is that that means they will oppose affirmative action and black economic empowerment. Well, let's hear them speak for themselves. The head of policy for the Democratic Alliance is Gwen Nguyenia. Gwen, good morning. Good morning. Firstly, how would you describe the policies you've adopted as a party over the weekend? Well, the first day was really to talk about our values and principles, and I think that was absolutely essential because policy has to be developed from a common foundation and understanding that you're all coming from the same place. On the second day, as you said, the, the main discussion was the uh, economic justice policy, which, looked at, which looks at how we plan to address economic exclusion. And I must say that on, from our point of view, actually, um, the, the race issue was not the main uh, bit about this policy. The main issue was not um, do we use race or don't use race. The main issue was how do we effectively deal with economic exclusion, considering that current policies which have attempted to do so have failed. You talk about adopting a policy of non-racialism. How do you define that? I mean, throughout history, there's sort of different definitions of non-racialism. What do you mean by that? Yes. I think we're going back to a concept to an understanding of non-racialism that was actually very common during the struggle of, um, of during apartheid in South Africa and also really in the 90s. But slowly we've actually begun to shift away from understanding non-racialism as a rejection of the racial classifications of the past. I think what we want to really commit uh, to is the fact that race classification is itself a legacy of apartheid. The unfortunate thing is that this current policy um, of the current government happens to be called black and economic empowerment, but it's black economic empowerment by name only. It has not resulted in the empowerment of the majority of black South Africans. So whilst we are fully in support of the empowerment of black South Africans and the empowerment of white South Africans and all South Africans, in fact, um, we think that our policy, this economic justice policy, which is tabled this weekend, will do far more um, to actually include South Africans in the economy than our current approaches have done. Gwen and Gwenya, thank you very much indeed. Head of Policy for the Democratic Alliance, 24 minutes after 7. Let's get a view from Professor Somododa Fekeni, the political analyst. Professor, good morning. You will have heard Gwen and Gwenya there. Do you agree with her? Do you think that most South Africans are going to be attracted to this policy? Well, sorry, the, the podcast stopped there. But as I recall, Somododa was concerned that the DA still had some baggage that he felt it needed to unpack before its policy would get more traction. Well, it so happens that both Gwen and Somododa are friends of mine, and over the years have become two of the many people who have helped me reach further than my grasp in my professional social work role, especially in the work on the Wild Coast, which I've been doing to challenge the social injustice on, against the Amadeva community over the Tolabeni mining venture and Sanral's end to Wild Coast shortcut. Well, some four years ago, before Gwen entered politics as a member of parliament, we got to know each other after the murder of Bazooka Khadebe, the chair of the Amadiba Crisis Committee, with whom I'd been working closely. Now, Gwen was one of the people who helped me gain deeper perspective after that shocking event, and we've sort of stayed in touch as her career has gone through the ups and downs of South African politics. Similarly, insofar as I may have been something of an elder to Gwen, Somodora has been an elder to me. And since meeting him seven years ago at the state funeral of King Mpondombini Sikals, Somodora has become my go-to man to get some insight in trying to find my voice to speak truth to power with more clarity and conviction about what was happening in the Wild Coast and in the Mpondo traditional leadership dispute. Well, Somodora was a great help to me in the writing of my book, and I was really honored to have him speak at my book launch five years ago. By the way, there's a very interesting interview I did with Somodoro two years ago, and it's up on my YouTube channel, and I'll give you the link at the end, which is well worth watching. Okay, so now you can understand why after hearing first Gwen and then 
answering Stephen's questions, I did not hit the snooze button on my radio alarm and go back to sleep. Instead, I grabbed my smartphone and asked them if they would bring their tough minds and tender hearts into a joint conversation on REAP. I wanted a few more participants, so canvassed in my network, and fortunately an environmental lawyer, Sikamo Ntola, with whom I'd worked also on the Wild Coast toll road litigation some years ago, was available at short notice. Uh, Sikamo is now a senior lecturer in public law at UNISA. Well, then the next tough-minded and tender-hearted friend that Stephen had on the show was Professor Teniko Maluleke. And he was on the show yesterday to talk about racism and advertising. Mediated conversation on SAFM. Seven minutes to nine. Continue a mediated conversation around transformation of institutions. Professor Teniko Maluleke is a political analyst at the University of Pretoria. Prof, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning to the listeners. You heard the conversation around the definition of transformation, but I wonder, in a way, as a country, we're still having the argument about what it might mean. Yes, indeed. Part of the problem, Stephen, is that we can't really talk about transformation of corporations or companies without talking about transformation of the country as a whole. There's this discussion we're having about clicks, uh, for example, uh, so you have a, a country in which a vast majority of people are excluded economically and culturally. But the big issue is that we have a historical problem. And transformation is historical. And also transformation is intersectional. Um, it's not merely about race. It's about class. It's about gender. I mean, this whole conversation around the clicks issue was quite revealing in the fact that here was an issue about hair, uh, black hair, its uh, supposed inferiority. And yet, in the process of fighting that issue, we saw a young journalist being pushed around. We saw uh, a kind of language that was used uh, to debate the issue being uh, very crude, uh, very insensitive in terms of gender. And then you realize that actually all these things are interrelated. And I think you'll agree with me. Tanika is one of those who gets that balance exactly right. To, as a pastor, to comfort the afflicted with his tender heart, but also as a rigorous academic, to afflict the comfortable with his tough mind. I met Tanika when he was serving as the president of the South African Council of Churches about 10 years ago, I think when he was a guest speaker at a seminar organized by the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute, which an NGO which had been another vital part of my ecosystem of social support. But it turned out that Tinika also shared a love for the Pondaland Wild Coast, and he blew some more wind into my sails to encourage me in my work to stay the distance and trying to resolve that conflict between human rights, mining rights, and, of course, the deeper issue of our human species and the way we relate to the natural world. Well, to be honest, the whole clicks advert and the response by the economic freedom fighters had left me rather perplexed from the previous week's news because despite my professional bias to try and instill hope, I really couldn't see anything good coming from it as things played out. But Tanika's plea for a society-wide holistic process of transformation really did cheer me up. I got hold of him and of course he had no hesitation to agree to join the conversation. Now I've already talked about the Wild Coast in this intro as well as in each of our previous seven episodes I think, but I was actually wanting to try and have a conversation about something other than that magnificent obsession of mine. In fact in the family gatherings of my large tribe I have been forbidden now from talking about the Wild Coast unless absolutely essential, because a few years ago my children and their cousins, without telling me, played a drinking game that whenever I mentioned the Wild Coast, they all had to have another large swallow of their drinks. <laughs> anyway, go and pour yourself a drink and sit back and let me tell you the story about how my fifth guest, Richard Spur, earned himself a place at this round table, because this really is cause for celebration. Well, about two hours after Stephen went off the air at a precisely 10.53 a.m., fate conspired to force the Wild Coast into the conversation when a message came through 
on the Friends of the Amadiba WhatsApp group from Johan Lawrenson of Richard Spoor Attorneys with news that threw the balls in the air again. Judge Tinsualo Makubele of the North Gauteng High Court had handed out a landmark court judgment that scored another victory for us. Their application for unrestricted automatic right of access to the mining rights application over the ancestral lands was granted. Well, this followed on the landmark judgment they got from Judge Anneli Basson two years ago, which had upheld their right to free, prior and informed consent before any mining right could be granted over their land. I found it personally as a massive indication because, you know, even though I'd written this book titled The Promise of Justice five years ago, I knew, and I knew that the long arc of the moral universe does ultimately bend towards justice, as Theodore Parker said in the midst of the struggle against slavery two centuries ago, I really was beginning to think I would not get to see the harvest of our labours. In my book, I quote T.S. Eliot's lines from Choruses of the Rock, which another good friend, Reverend Dean Abrams, in fact, shared with me some 20 years ago. In fact, I've asked Len if he would read those lines. I have trodden the wine press alone, and I know that it is hard to be really useful, resigning the things that men count for happiness, seeking the good deeds that lead to obscurity, accepting with equal face those that bring ignominy, the applause of all, or the love of none. All men are ready to invest their money, but most expect dividends. I say to you, make perfect your will. I say, take no thought of the harvest, but only of proper sowing. Well, the major difference is, is that I certainly have not trodden a wine press alone. I just have the biggest mouth, which has got me into trouble with the Australian mining company and especially the founder, Mark Caruso, who has not got the dividends he and his investors had expected from the Kolobeni mineral sands. And he is understandably cross with me about that. But at the start of my involvement way back in 2006, when his company were preparing to lodge their first mining rights application, I had warned him that proper sowing in that instance meant respecting the right of the Amadiba under their customary law and the constitution to freely come to an informed decision if they were going to give, give consent to mining over their ancestral lands and that he should not trust the BE partners that he had teamed up with, Zolko, the Kolobeni Empowerment Project. Now Zolko had been founded in 2003 with three directors with his brother Patrick, uh, a local leader, Zamile Cunha, and an attorney, Max Bukwana, as founding directors. I also have a film on my YouTube channel, which Jonathan Rands did with Zamile Cunha, way back in 2003, soon after Zolka had been formed, which tells some really interesting insights given the passage of time. Well, the Amadiba community at large did not trust Zamile Cunha and Zolko, because of their manipulations and deceits. Now, the Bill of Rights is quite unambiguous that people have the right of access to information that is held by the state or any other party that is necessary for the protection of all the other rights contained in the Constitution. Now, surely it is self-evident that a community that faces the prospect of their ancestral lands being turned into an open caste mine have the right to know from the state who has been granted the mining right to do so. Now there is a very interesting backstory, which I won't go into now, which tells how we had to resort to James Bond-like spycraft to get hold of the shareholders agreement between MRC and Zolko. Well, it still sends shivers down my spine when I think of what might have happened if we had not got that information. Some hundred families would have been forced to hand over their crop fields and homesteads and be relocated somewhere in an RDP-type housing scheme. And they would only get benefit from the revenue stream, not when mining commenced, but only when the entity that was supposed to represent their interests, Zolko, had paid off a loan at commercial rates of 18 million rands. We had also managed to get spreadsheets that showed the expenditure and revenue projections for the 22-year life of the mine. It showed that it would take 10 years of mining 
before the Amadiba through Zolka would be in the black and actually start receiving some material dividend. So no wonder MRC considered this information to be commercially sensitive and didn't want us to see that shareholders agreement in the spreadsheet. Well, given that context, you can imagine how excited I was to again be stirred from my slumber this morning when Stephen Crotus interviewed Richard Spoor. SAFM, leading the conversation. An important ruling in the High Court in Pretoria yesterday, Judge Tinsualo Makobele ruled that the community around Kolobeni in the Eastern Cape have the right to see a mining application that will affect them. In other words, as I understand it, when a mining company puts in an application to mine in a particular area, the community now has the right to see that application. Well, the attorney representing the community is Richard Spur from Spur Attorneys. Richard, hi, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. How important is this in terms of the power balance between a community and a mining company? It's absolutely fundamental. You know, up till now, communities have only seen an environmental assessment and been allowed to participate in that. But they've not been allowed to see what the mining plan actually is. Who is this company that's applied? Who are their shareholders? What is their PEE component? How is it comprised? What capital do they have? Um, and that's vital for the determination of a license application and, of course, for the right to object to it. So during this struggle, the, uh, for years, the DMR and the mining company resisted handing over their mining rights application. They finally did, but we persisted with the application, wanting to establish a point of principle, and that has now happened. So this makes a big difference not only for the Colvani community, but also for communities and property owners and occupiers across the country who are allowed to see what it is that is being proposed and what application is being considered by the DMR. There's still a huge fight. I mean, it seems quite bizarre to me in Kolobeni that, I mean, this has been going on for a long time now. The mining company still wants to mine there, despite really strong opposition from the community that you represent. Why is the why is the mining company, why is the department, the Mineral Resources Department, they still seem to be pushing very hard for this? We don't really know what the answer is to that question. I mean, you know, another principle is that if your mining right has been refused once, can you come again and again and again and again? Does this ever end? And that's the principle that still needs to be established because right now, every time they get knocked back, it's been at least 15 years, um, they come again. They amend it. They change their BE partners. They change their plan. They bring another one. And it looks as if we're locked in a never-ending struggle. And we want the principle established that once your application has been refused, that's it for you and other people who are coming after you. I mean, in a normal legal process, so if you think of a criminal court, you have an appeal process, and you get usually one, one appeal. You go to the High Court, you go to the Supreme Court of Appeal, and that's it, unless there's a constitutional issue. I mean, that would seem to be the precedent to follow. Yep. We won the appeal. The minister set aside their mining rights, and they came right back with a new one. And it looks as if we're stuck in that trap for, for eternity. Well, if you look at all the videos I've uploaded on my channel, you will probably find that Richard features more than anyone else as one of my interlocutors and one of the characters which feature. They also put on record what Richard has done over the last few years to address the manifold injustices of the mining industry. Well, Richard came to rescue me 14 years ago when I realized I was getting in over my head when the dark and dirty truth started to surface about the Klolobeni mining venture. I'd been helping them really just to promote their local community-based ecotourism and had been doing so for a number of years. When the mining ogre emerged, I realized that we were up against a challenge that was much larger than anything a social worker could address. I like to think that I've become something of Richard's wingman to watch out for trouble. Now, two years ago, that was graphically illustrated when Richard found himself arrested and charged for pointing his finger at a police officer. Fortunately, I was pointing my camera at Richard and the police officers. When we appealed to the National Prosecuting Authority, given all the evidence we had, the charges were dropped like a hot brick. But it was, it was just another episode in what's been an epic saga. I'm hoping that one day maybe Netflix will realize that there's a story here to be told that doesn't require too much imagination. But it hasn't all been about Richard and I unnerving each other with courage under fire. 
Last year I got a call from him inviting me to accompany him to an event to serve as his kind of bodyguard in case he got mobbed by admirers when he received, believe it or not, a Man of the Year award from the Gauteng Provincial Government. A man who a year before had been arrested for pointing his finger at a police officer. So it was really highly ironic that Richard should be honoured by this and I'm very grateful that uh, he is be now being recognised as somebody that's been the difference that has made the difference. So soon after he had finished with Stephen this morning, I didn't hesitate when I invited him to join this conversation. So with that long backstory, I think you now understand why we've got two pegs to hang our conversation on. The bad news story of the cliques controversy and racism and the lack of transformation in corporate society, etc. And the good news story of how a rural community, remote, vulnerable and disadvantaged, have humbled everyone by getting a high court judgment that affirms their right to something which really ought to have been automatic. So well, thanks for staying the course. The best is yet to come. So in the slipstream of Stephen Groter's excellent coverage of Things That Matter, and dare I say the excellent judgment of his producers of always calling on my friends to educate their listeners, let's start with Tineko. If you could introduce yourself, just give us a heading or two of what is of interest to you in the mix of these issues, and then we'll go around the group so they can check in too. Yes, uh... My name is Tiniko Maluleke. I am a senior research fellow at the Center for the Advancement of Scholarship, University of Pretoria. Yeah, I think, I think this is a very important conversation. Um, but I think for me, it's important to always remember the intersections between race, gender, um, citizenship, environment and land uh, that we we talk about these things in an interconnected manner because it's not possible and land includes uh, of course mining if you like uh, we 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 can't talk about any of these things as if they they exist in isolation of one another i think that for me is a is an important uh, uh, a starting point. Thank you. Green, with a butterfly on your shoulder, looks lovely. <laughs> yes, I managed to make that work. Um, I'm Gwen Nguenya, I'm the Head of Policy for the Democratic Alliance. Um, I suppose as kind of introductory comments, for me it's, it's two things. I feel like we need to discuss more as a country about where we actually want to go to. And I think a lot of the disagreements are because we actually not agreed about the destination. So if we look at the two, and I, and I want to touch on two issues there. Um, what is our destination in terms of redress? What are we trying to achieve? And then also on, on, on racial issues. So on redress for me, the two diverging paths is either one that says that redress means addressing um, the economic exclusions of the past, for example, if you talk about economic redress, that's one approach that by redress, we want to achieve greater economic inclusion. The other path conceives of redress as more about atonement or reparations. And the two, I think, are, are different and lead you, around, uh, lead you to different paths. And I think if we look at the the justice policy that has that you know I've been working on lately. Some people feel that it doesn't sufficiently ask for those who are responsible for the past to atone, and I would agree. Yes, it doesn't do that. It's not a, a redress approach focused on atonement or reparations. It's a it's a redress approach focused on addressing economic exclusion, um, and we can explore that more in detail later. The other point that I think we need to agree on regarding race relations is whether we want to head towards a future in which race no longer plays a part in our social relations or whether our destination is one where race continues to be present and please don't get me wrong we're talking about the future so i know currently that race defines our relations but but where do we hope uh, in the future to be and I think, again, that gives us two diverging paths, because for a long time, I realized 
a lot of people in South Africa talk about non-racialism, but we are all talking about different things. Some people talk of non-racialism, but what I feel they actually mean is multiracialism. Their non-racialism has no desire to actually remove race. Their non-racialism is deeply grounded in a reality where race will always be a feature of our, of our, of our race relations. And I call that view more fittingly multiracialism. Non-racialism for me is the part that says we envision a future in which race no longer plays. It's a non-racial, it's a society in which race, relate, race is not a feature because we recognize race as a false belief that was you know, put um, by an illegitimate um, government and the, the system of race classification is illegitimate. So I just want to talk about those diverging paths, a diverging path on redress and diverging paths on, on racialism. Uh, thank you very much, John, and uh, greetings to my fellow panelists, uh, colleagues whom I know uh, in different platforms. I just want to say uh, currently I'm the director of special projects and also the advisor of the vice chancellor of the University of South Africa. I'm also the founding member and the convener of the Indo Lamity Scenarios 2030. And I've been involved in the heritage sector quite extensively in crafting white papers, transformation documents, as well as this establishment of the National Heritage Council. On the key question, national question, I do think that in the first instance, we are currently a noisy, argumentative, temperamental, and headline-obsessed democracy currently. We deal with the headline the following week, we have moved to the next one. That's why we do not have a grip on deep systemic and structural problems that we face. So it's more of a PR exercise from political, from business, and so forth. What I think fundamentally we ought to have is a very difficult conversation and a strategic conversation about the future. And in so doing, we would have to be brutally honest and deal with some of the things which are actually uncomfortable. Because if the well-meaning mainstream people don't do that, then the extremists naturally take that space and run with it because they are commonsensical issues that mainstream tend to refuse to deal with. I think there are just three basic things, then I'll stop there so that we can allow for the proper reflections. The first one, we have a divided past, therefore the main project of nation building should be to deal with the legacy of the past, which is the redress. The second one is to unite a country that was divided. And the third one is to create a prosperous society where the cake expands in order to accommodate rising needs and demands while still being globally competitive. So I think those are the three things that we ought to be dealing with. And of course, we can come back to the intersectionality of the different variables that make that a possibility. Thank you. Good afternoon to, to, to everyone. Um, I'm MC Moyam Gelandola, as indicated by John. Um, I'm a senior lecturer at the Public Constitution International Law Department um, at UNISA. Um, and I, I, I just my my two cents, John. Um, I think Prof. Somadota and Gwen have captured at least the historical elements of our discourse very succinctly. For me, um, and mindful of the fact that we are looking towards the future, um, my interest is how do we shape um, our desired progress in light of um, looming crises, and by this I mean. Primarily, how are we going to address all these issues knowing that we face an existential crisis in the form of climate change? Um, if anything, what COVID-19 has demonstrated to us 
is the ability of different jurisdictions to manage a crisis. Um, what we do know for a fact is that owing to changing climates, um, we will face many a crisis moving forward. And that obviously has a, an effect on our developmental agenda as a country and as a continent moving forward. Um, and it touches on issues that um, hit a raw nerve in South Africa, land being one of them. Um, and it's, 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 again, as in indicated by Prof earlier, there are intersections with regards to our discourse. And I think to the extent possible, we ought to, um, you know, discuss it. So, so yeah, that's, that's really what I hope to take out of it, um, at least to learn from the varying perspectives. Um, I know that, um, you know, the recent victory by the global community in, in Kolobeni, you know, does speak to, to some extent towards that. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear perhaps what Richard would, would also say. So, yeah, that's it from my end. Okay, Sporo, over to you. Yeah, well, maybe if I could just do a little introductory blurb. Um, I'm, I'm an attorney based in, uh, in Pumalanga, in White River, to be more precise. Um, special interest in, in um, land, um, mining, and uh, workers' occupational disease and injuries, which has been a big part of the work that I've done. Um, the issues that interest me um, um, that occupy my mind right now is, is, is the role of elites in um, setting the agenda for society, um, determining the dialogue that is held, and contrasting those elites, which include our, our ruling class and our politicians and our businessmen and our academics and our journalists, with the great majority of our people who, I think if there's one uniquely defining feature, it's their lack of agency, their sense of powerlessness, their sense of a lack of control over their own lives, their own destiny, and, and to an ever greater extent to control over the country that we live in. And to me, that tension between elites and the people without agency is by far the biggest and most important um, divide, intersectional line, if you like, um, between those who, who kind of govern and direct and the rest of us. And I think until we're able to give people agency, which, which is a is a, is a real thing as well. It's the tools to control your life and direct it, but also the confidence that you do have agency and that you can exercise it through political processes, through your activity in civil society and the like. Um, until we address that lack of agency and that sense of powerlessness, um, I, I don't think there's much of a future for us. And I think our real challenge is to, to empower ordinary people, to make them feel that they are able to contribute and shape the world in the way that they'd like it to be. Um, that by way of introduction, um, John asked me to speak briefly on the Kolobeni issue and, and how that's relevant. Well, I've been involved with Kolobeni, I think, for the last 15 years, um, representing that community in a range of struggles, as we've represented other communities as well in the Northwest Province, in Limpopo and other places. And as per the victory yesterday, you know, we've achieved quite significant things. We've achieved um, very significant court rulings that um, spell out the rights and the powers of communal landowners, and also that spell out the right processes that should govern the way that um, that land is allocated, controlled, and, and critically um, alienated to, to vested interests, large corporations, um, influential politicians who wish to take up farming, um, a, range of, a range of elites who, who, who have an interest in the land wish to take control of it. Um, 
But the Kolobeni community is, is, is quite unique and, um, well, not entirely unique, but it is unique in the sense it's a very well organized um, community. It's, it's, it's disciplined, it's controlled, there's awareness, there is, there is quite a lot of power in that community. They've, they've, they've exercised power and they can exercise their power. And that is true for some other communities as well. I mean, we're at Somkele, not nearly the same kind of levels of coordination and, and, and power. Um, and, in, and in parts of the Northwest province as well on the platinum belt, we've seen communities um, coming together, being strong, being able to assert their rights and defend them. But that is the rare exception. Um, I was reading something today about um, assassinations and killings of activists in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, um, KwaZulu-Natal around mining and mining issues, around Richards Bay minerals and around Sumkele where we're working at present. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but perhaps 30, 40 assassinations and killings in the last, um, the last year, the last few years, I'm sorry. Um, and what strikes me is that these victories that we've achieved at, at Holobeni and other places, they don't translate into any significant change in these other communities. They translate into change for communities that are organized and empowered and in a, an ability to enforce these rules and these rights. I mean, fundamentally, the violence in KwaZulu Natal around this mining, as it appears to me, um, has to do with the, the lack of control and the lack of power that ordinary people have. This is tribal chiefs and headmen and the Gunyama Trust um, that exercise enormous um, power over land, um, are in a position to allocate land to people, to award licenses, award contracts, lease land and the like. Um, and in the absence of an organized, powerful community, um, the response from individuals who suffer the brunt of this is, is resistance. They resist, they refuse, they oppose, they stand up against their chiefs. And often, as individuals, the response of these elites is to crush them, to intimidate them, to threaten them, and if worst comes to worst, to kill them. Um, and the response from the powerless, um, in the absence of any kind of coherent framework that they can use to advance their rights and protect their rights, their response is also violence. And so I see this kind of, this violence in these communities um, about land and access to land is directly related to the, on the one hand, the failure of the state to create structured mechanisms by which these issues can be addressed and resolved. And on the other, by the failure of our failure to be able to translate the victories we've achieved in some communities into others. They haven't been turned into law. They haven't been turned into real power for ordinary people. Um, the battle in most the rural areas where uh, I'm, I, I'm most at home, um, you know, is still very much uh, a struggle between elites exercising brute power and, of course, its converse patronage over a largely disempowered um, mass of people out there. Um, so this makes me acutely aware of two things. One, the limitations of the work that I do. So establishing some fine legal principle about communities' rights to control the destiny and the control of the land doesn't really mean a lot in a, in, in a community that's unable to to leverage that, that theoretical power that they enjoy. And the second thing it does is it reminds me how the, 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 the government, the state, has failed to translate um, these achievements, these principles into practical systems. I mean, if you look at uh, tenure reform in this country, we are still sitting with the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act, a very poorly um, uh, defined interim law that was supposed to presage a far more comprehensive reform uh, entrenching people's rights in and over their land 
And we've just failed to do it. Now, why have we failed to do it? Well, my personal theory is because the state is very, is hostage to the political support of elites in the rural areas um, and simply doesn't have the courage to stand up for the disempowered and the powerlessness, the powerless, um, and is totally beholden to these elites and their interests and therefore permits this, um, this situation to persist. Um, and I think the failure to reform the laws around tenure in rural areas is, is, is perhaps a very, very significant sign of, of, of elite capture and their lack of desire, lack of interest, lack of willingness to, uh, to, to empower people. Um, it's, it's a damning condemnation, I think, of our state. I think I'll leave it there, John. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. So, my daughter, can I ask you to respond to that? Because it relates to the issue of traditional leadership. Uh, it's, it is important to recognize that part of the success of the Abadiba, in first their right to free, fry, and informed consent, was the fact that they based it on Pondo customary law as well, and the inclusive participatory nature of decision-making at local levels that then would filter up. Um, and so in that sense, it, and you, you are a man, deep roots in rural communities, you understand that, and I think you're one of the people that batted for the place of traditional leadership in the uh, Constitution as being somehow another way of putting a break on power as a correction to the, uh, the power that's exercised the legislature and the executive. Um, so I'd like you to respond to Richard first, if you don't mind. And then, of course, Gwen, <laughs> I get a sense that you don't hold much truck for traditional leadership. You're a well-educated, modern young woman who's now very much into a different sort of mindset, which is what I love about this country, is that we do have this. We talk about diversity of race. There's also diversity of those sorts of contexts as well. And, of course, the rest of you can comment as well. But so I don't know how you feel about that. Let's respond. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I think what this story of Kolobeni is reminding us is the importance of our constitutional democracy as an arbiter when it looks like people may use their authority in government, in municipalities, or even in traditional authority to usurp the powers. All what I want to say is having participated in the crafting or in the research towards the crafting of chapter 12 of our constitution, which speaks to traditional leadership and having written quite extensively on this particular subject, touching on it on my doctorate as well. What we often hear the traditional elite in some instances talking about as their traditional powers is a distorted version of what tradition is. Because when you go back, there was a say, inkosi, inkosi ngabantu, which means you couldn't violate the sovereignty of people. You got your legitimacy from people and people have the communal ownership of land. Hence, it is important to consult the community rather than to strike deals between traditional leaders or municipal officials and big business people. We see this happening right across the country where a person wants to mine, a person wants to open up a fuel station. They go bribe a traditional leader and the traditional leader basically sell the land of people without consulting the people. So this is a reminder that the sovereignty of the people is still there, even under traditional rulership. Customarily, that's how it was supposed to be. But the Act of 1927 and another one of 1951 of traditional authorities did distort this because it then turned traditional leaders into mere civil servants 
working as extended arms of colonial and apartheid authorities. And some of the traditional leaders are still using that particular notion of saying, I'm the ruler here. No traditional leader is the owner of land. They hold the authority, they hold the land in trust on behalf of the people, and they govern with the advisory councils on behalf of the people, and they always have to go back to the people whenever people's lives are to be affected by mining, by selling of the land, by grazing land, or any other things that are to be taken on the ground. Thank you. Gwen, before you say, Carmen, just let me put in parentheses. You were in Parliament. I was thrilled to bits when you uh, were elected as an MP and swore an oath of office because when you did so, uh, prior to you being there, Gareth Morgan, who was a DA MP, who had, was an invaluable part of us getting answers in terms of information by posing parliamentary questions. And that's why I was thrilled that, you know, since he's left, that you are now back in and that you could be that conduit. Not because you're necessarily a member of a political party, but you've sworn an oath of office to uphold the Constitution which expect nice, and there were even some of my ANC MP friends which were pleased that Gareth was asking some of those questions because they were in an invidious position too because they couldn't ask them because of the way party, parties tend to work. Are you going back to Parliament now? Are you able to kind of take, take those things up? What's your future? And then respond to what, you know, what Richard said too because, of course, there's a huge vacuum of good legislation that translates land rights into participatory inclusive processes. It's amazing after this long that that still needs to be said. But anyways, um, I think, you know, on a, on a personal note, I don't have any immediate plans to return back to Parliament. I mean, my, my interest has always been in policy making and policy development. Um, and you know, not necessarily to be, although a lot of people would consider me a politician right now, I'm not technically a politician, I'm not an elected official. I happen to write policy for a political party that um, pays me to write policy, but I am not a politician in the sense of being an elected public representative. Um, I, may, I may choose to go back into, um, into that in the next term, but there's no immediate plans um, to do that, to answer that, that question. But on the, um, you know, some, just what I was thinking from what Sumadod and also what Richard have said is that, you know, my view is that what this brings out quite starkly is that this false perception between, diff, you know, this false, um, I think, hostility between the idea of individualism and groups is shown to be false. Because I think for me, what this illustrates is that Groups fundamentally derive from individual consent. And what I see are community members, individuals standing up to say, you know, there is no judicial authority. There is no authority without the consent of those who agree to be so governed. And I think that's a very important thing to understand in South Africa is that the individual community members in that community exist first before the community and then of course they decide to follow whatever um you know process of laws or recognize um you know what whatever authority that that they do so but it's actually a symbiotic relationship between individuals and groups and any society that pretends we are all just individuals and ignores the importance of groups obviously is destined to fail but similarly any society that imagines that the group or the authority has um you know, basically as divine right over individuals and that the individuals in those groups have no say and don't exist is also destined to come against, um, you know, challenges. So I think it just shows how, how important those two are, is that for any authority, for any organization to, um, to heed the, the interests, the desires of the, of the members who make up that particular community. And I think it just, for me, kind of shows the falsehoods and the, and the idea that there's tension between the idea of the importance of individuals as individuals in those communities and the importance of, of the groups um, that, that they represent. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Tiniko, Sikamo. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, look, I think the Kolobeni matter is uh, 
is quite refreshing and it is it is um, hopefully going to be a precedent and that uh, going forward um, both the traditional leadership and the government leadership will take seriously the concerns of uh, the community in the in in the manner in which they go about uh, granting uh, uh, not just mining rights but any business rights as uh, one of the speakers has already said so one hopes that but even as we celebrate and th there is a part of me that worries uh, you know because um, the elites of whom uh, my colleague was speaking never give up um, and they are very resourceful. So I fear that uh, this uh, celebration uh, may, be, may be cut short still. And, and I hope that uh, we are able to take full advantage of it and that it is sustainable before they hatch up another, <laughs> another plan because they constantly do that. So, so Madhuda said that um, Nkosi, Nkosi Ngabantu, I'm sure he was referring to this book by Msimang. <laughs> Nkosi, Nkosi Ngabantu. Um, mm. <laughs> but, but, but that Nkosi, Nkosi Ngabantu also applies to government. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I think it applies even more to government because uh, governments come and go, uh, so do traditional leaders, but governments particularly have a, a much shorter lifespan and ought always to be, to be very aware of uh, their rights and their responsibilities uh, in relation to, to the locals. Now, we have a, a huge backlog of um, the manner in which traditional leaders have been treated in this country. Uh, at one stage, the idea was to break the back of traditional leaders, to make them superfluous, to make them irrelevant. Um, and in some ways, that project has not, has not failed completely uh, because many of them uh, have made themselves or have become superfluous and irrelevant. And, and in some cases, they are a stumbling block, quite honestly, to, uh, to progress in communities. But the other use of traditional leaders has been to make them agents, agents of, um, of government and other uh, facilities, uh, I mean, other um, proprietors who, who want to come in and, and do business. And so we, we need to, to find a way of continuing the cleanup of the traditional authority house, as it were, so that that traditional authority becomes a kind of a balance, um, a reference point when the municipalities and government um, are going off track, that they become a check, a checking force, as it were, and that you have government and traditional leaders working together, not necessarily always in agreement, but as counterpoints uh, to one another, so that people are able to, um, uh, to advance their interests uh, because they are ultimately the owners of the land and everything that is uh, uh, underneath it. Um, so, so for me, in that sense, this is, a, this is an important victory. I just hope it's not short-lived, and I just hope that it is sustainable. Sitamo, can I just, I, I mean, frame your question I want to put to you, because you're now in the, in the context of public law and your environmental lawyer particularly. I had a conversation with um, Vali Musa, the former minister, Mohammed Vali Musa, a while back, and he was telling me how proud he was of the fact that he, in the constitution drafting process, they had managed to get into the Bill of Rights, environmental rights, section 24, is it? 
Um, and he said, John, use that as your basis of all your agency and your empowerment and your work as a social worker, which, by the way, social workers' first obligations are simply to uphold the Bill of Rights and, to, on, and seek the most best interest of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. And I'm just simply saying that because there's nothing particularly exceptional about me. I was just doing my job. And I could come to my grief and grievance about the fact that social workers have been one of the professions which has been disempowered as playing that vital interface role with communities. But let me park that, because the point I wanted to make is that when I spoke to Vali Musa, I said to him, and he, he, we then got into talking about the, the, the fact that traditional leadership uh, was also entrenched in the Constitution. What's it, uh, chapter... 12, 13, I can't remember. And, and he said there was a huge fight in the constitution drafting process as to whether or not to include them. And I said to him, but, you know, Minister, why didn't you make a connection and link the Bill of Rights, Chapter 2, as being the traditional leaders, as in a sense, custodians of those rights, particularly thinking of the land rights, environmental rights, which would not have been in any way in tension with what the customary law had been suggested. And I remember him looking to me as if, you know, with almost a blank look on his face, he says, why didn't we? It's almost so obvious. Now, it's interesting because in my work with the Amadiba and the Amampondo, the queen, former queen, who's now been deposed, she saw herself as the custodian of the Bill of Rights, as did the late king in Pondignini Sikar. And that's why we found our basis of working together, is that she was a traditional leader who committed herself and was, showed far more fidelity to the, her, to the Bill of Rights and to the Constitution than cabinet ministers who swear an oath of office to uphold them. So that for me is like a blaring lesson that I've learned. So with that little bit of a rant, Siklamo, are you the lawyer? Is there a prospect that we can start seeing a kind of an integration, an intersectionality between customary law and environmental law. Well, what, what, what I have issue is, is probably your point of departure because it supposes that this intersectionality between custom and environment doesn't exist. It's, the contrary is actually quite true because within customary practices, um, they are, it is replete with examples of how such practices actually aid or desire um, to advance environmental protection and preservation. So it wouldn't therefore be surprising um, that the queen or the now deposed queen of the Amampondo, um, you know, accepted these tenets of, of our democracy um, in, in, in the manner that, 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 that you indicate. Um, to also get to, to, to what has been raised, um, I've, I've personally worked uh, uh, in Tolobini and, and I've, you'd know we've been there together. We've attended, um, you know, Gomkulu at, at Ngungungovu um, and, and we, we, we've done work extensively there. So notions of democracy, we've, we've witnessed there and we can bear testament to it. Um, and it's because of that really strong democratic ethos, which I don't want to say is necessarily owing to um, this present constitutional dispensation, but has al already has been existing, existing for centuries. And that's really just what's come through here um, in, in, in one aspect that I want to, to indicate. The, the, the other elements that, that, um, that have been touched on, and, and I, I just want to go back to what Richard has said, and this is also a cause of concern for me, I mean, a recent conversation, a, a, a colleague of mine had indicated that in South Africa, violence is increasingly becoming the love language um, between the people and those who govern the people. So if, if anything needs to be done um, pertaining to, you know, how people are governed, pertaining to them enforcing their rights, um, pertaining to them even going as far as enforcing their own inherent dignity, um, violence seems to be the best language understood by those who govern the people. So, I mean, that's replete in examples in what Richard has indicated in Tolobeni. You would know, obviously, um, the assassination of Bazooka. Um, I also have an understanding of that in KZN, working um, with the Ngonyama Trust, um, representing the people of, 
of Makassaneni near Malmuth there. So, so that's, that's, that's a growing concern. And I think you see, you know, this violence and, 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 and brutality, not only, you know, in, 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 in matters pertaining to land in rural communities, but you see it in urban areas. Um, where it comes to service delivery protests, we saw it recently now, um, you know, the sense of anarchy. Anar this is a concern, is that in order for citizens to merely assert what has been adopted as constitutional imperatives and what people have sworn to protect and defend, um, they have to embark on some element of violence in order to bring those about. And I think that's a concern. Um, and in closing, I, I, I think that concern trickles over to the significance of the Kolobeni decision. And that being that if, you know, those in government and administrators were really doing their job, um, then such judicial action would never be really be necessary because the primary question is always, you know, who, who are the affected um, who are the affected communities and the interesting parties to this application and what are their inputs um, with regards to. So it's, it's concerning that our legislative provisions don't um, exhaustfully make provisions for, you know, affected and interested communities to make those sort of inputs. Um, environmental legislation only provides, um, you know, that consultation needs to be undertaken. But the inputs of the people who are being consulted um, you know, aren't necessarily taken uh, in the highest cognizance by administrators who need to make those decisions. So we tend to see that the, the general benefit of all trumps those who are immediately impacted um, by any developmental project, one being mining, being, you know, what any form of construction. Um, so, 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 so I think that's also a concern that um, one, you know, fighting in the courts has become um, the norm in South Africa when it comes to engaging government. Um, and, you know, fighting, um, you know, violently and, and, and the, the amount of physical violence that precipitates as a result, you know, of any dispute um, is also a growing concern from my end. Yes, I just wanted to, um, to add quickly that I think also on this issue about how we can make sure that these legal victories that are essentially obtained in courts translate even to those communities who don't necessarily aren't organized necessarily enough to translate those victories into, into, into meaningful judgments for them, is that maybe it's a bit of a lateral link, but I think it's important is that perhaps also now this movement towards, and I, I don't think it's necessarily the inclusion of independent candidates per se, but I think what this judgment around the ele electoral reform opens up the door for, even for political parties, never mind just independent candidates, is a political system much more rooted in constituencies and in communities than the one that we currently have. I think even if the representatives are still party representatives, if they if we move towards an electoral system where they are representing constituencies, there's a lot more of that direct link. And so a judgment, one would hope, could much more easily translate into some kind of legislative action because you have then this, this legal victory that you've obtained and you hopefully have a direct constituency representative in parliament that you can say, well, here are the legal gaps to, or here are the regulatory gaps to actually making full use or fully realizing the fruits of this particular judgment. But at the moment, when you've got a parliamentary system so disconnected to communities, it's a lot more difficult to hear these, co these community issues find expression um, in parliament. And one need only just look at even where the source of a lot of parliamentary regulation comes from. Um, I think I was looking, I don't know the exact number now, but certainly well over 90% of bills of legislation that's discussed in parliament comes more from the executive than from the legislators. In other words, you've got mostly cabinet actually running the parliamentary agenda. You don't have the elected representatives of people determining the parliamentary agenda. It's a parliamentary agenda entirely divorced from the concerns um, and, you know, of, of communities. And so hopefully a more community-based politics can arise from, from electoral reform. And maybe that's potentially one of the areas in where the, the answer lies. 
And now you come in there. Yes, sure. Mm. I just want to say quickly before you do so, my daughter, my wife would be thrilled to bits to see that because in many ways, the fact of that gap has meant that I've now found myself having to try in my social work role to ensure inclusive participatory processes. I mean, because there, there has been that, that disjuncture. So she would be thrilled to bits because then she can retire and not... <laughs> but so my daughter, carry on. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, ride on what Wen was saying, which is very important in terms of the electoral reforms, but link that to what Professor Dinyiko Maluleke said earlier, that the elite is quite resourceful. We shouldn't celebrate early because of the legal victory in Kolobeni, and we should not celebrate early because of the constitutional court judgment on the electoral reforms. I'll tell you why we need to have a deeper discussion about that. Countries like Zimbabwe do have a constituency-based system. Has that qualitatively improved democracy? Most of our municipalities, I think it's 40% is based on constituencies but they are still very much controlled by the political parties. So to me, I do think that we need another platform where we could exhaust different creative forms of electoral systems that allow for accountability and remove power away from the party elite or the political class manipulating that space. Again, we should not just limit ourselves to that. Some of us who have been working for more than 30 years in community development in the rural areas, even in the space of NGOs or community development or even the co-ops, civil society, you still have the same kind of rogue elements who become local barons the kinds of people that if you do not allow them to do an opening prayer in a meeting, they'll make sure that nothing happens. Mm -hmm. If you do not first go to them and brief them that I'm coming to this community to actually plant gardens for women and youth, because they are simply not involved, they'll block everything. And even some traditional leaders actually have been quite manipulative in a way of becoming small village uh, autocrats and they present themselves using these primordial identities so to me it's not just your ANC using its own party deployment structures and party list or DA using its own federal council system where the party elite sort of determines who goes elsewhere or EFF using its uh, central commandist approach and so forth it is how do we cultivate a new mindset and unlearn the current political culture? How do we make sure that people who join politics do not join politics or positions because it is the only avenue for social mobility and they become career politicians? They should do so because they are having a drive, they do have a calling to do community service. How do we create other opportunities even for retiring elite so that it doesn't become an existential crisis when you say, as a white counselor, your life is coming to an end. You can try something else business or something else in life or be a social entrepreneur. That's what is lacking. Our focus is too much preoccupied on the ANC or perhaps DA, but the whole system is corrupted. So we'll need to work on how we unlearn some tendencies and how we deal with the entire ecosystem of reforms, not just the electoral system, but create a vibrant economy where people become self-reliant, where uh, you know crass materialism doesn't become such that everybody wants to grab a piece of pie of state. And this has been the case, by the way, where ANC has been, you have seen corruption. Where DA has been, at least here in Tswane, we've seen 
corruption, wrong appointments, and so forth. So this obsession that if you change this party instead of that, instead of saying, how do we change the society such that whichever party comes in has certain basic standards to live up to? Thank you. Yeah, so Madonna, it reminds me that one of my sort of litanies and sort of mantras that I'm saying is, we've spoken truth to power for a long time. We now need to speak more about the truth about power, how it gets distributed, and et cetera. You know, there's a lot of focus in South Africa, misdirected a focus, and saying that the problem is the corrupt leadership, and we've got to change the culture of re- leadership. So the ANC is a political school. There's recently, recent talks about a school of governance for civil servants to teach them how to be honest and teach them how to be professional and ethical. But the problem, I, as I see it, is not so much corrupt leaders, but the, the weak and disempowered mass who can't hold them accountable. I mean, the corruption flows from... from um, the disempowered majority of people who don't have the confidence and the power to hold them accountable. You know, they're they're disempowered politically. We look at Zimbabwe, no one really has confidence. Political vote on its own isn't empowering enough. It's not good enough. They're educationally disempowered because of a poor educational system. They are materially disempowered because they're impoverished. They're economically disempowered because they don't have access to the kind of resources to make a living. I mean, what does Zimbabwe have in common with us? Well, a weak and really disempowered population, a a population that doesn't have agency and the ability to change that country. Um, If we want to change this society and see more um, more, um, honest politicians, we need to address the sense of powerlessness and the lack of agency of ordinary people. And that relates, as I said, not only political empowerment, but educational, economic, and material. And if we can change that, um, we will see people asserting themselves and taking its control. I think it was was Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, who said, um, the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those they oppress. And that's exactly the point here. People endure a lot of oppression by these elites because they feel so helpless. The elites are their way forward. It's through the elites that you're going to get a job. It's through the elites that you're going to get a house. It's through the elites that you're going to get an allocation of land. It's through the elites that you're going to get um, a tender and kind of become a successful businessman. Um, They are dependent weak, and in that that context, patronage and corruption absolutely thrive. So, look, it's not a solution, but the point is not to change the corrupt politicians. Uh, I think Soma Daddy made, Soma Dora made the point. You can replace them and rotate them, but they'll be just the same. We see it in community structures. One group replaced by the next, but there's very little difference between them. We need to empower ordinary people and that will change our society and we need to empower them across all these fronts to stand up and resist um, these elites. Richard, that um, happened. I think I want to make. That happened, but just to put a point before you go, that's what we did at Kolobeni. I mean, I simply was playing yes. what social workers do. I was very proud of the fact that Thanks to the right of access to information, we were able to get hold of the first mining rights application. The Daily Maverick article talked of, as if this latest victory is from a process that commenced in 2015. It's not correct. It started in 2006 already. And I just want to quickly give this brief narrative because it will just help bring things back down to earth. We applied for access to information to the first mining rights application. They said they would let me look at it and one other person. I had to travel all the way to Port Elizabeth. Fortunately, there was a, a happened to be a civil servant strike at the time, so they were short-staffed, so they weren't able to have somebody to supervise me as I flipped through this mining rights application. Um, and I was left alone for long enough for me to grab my camera and take photographs of this shareholders' agreement 
and a loan agreement that existed between a hitherto unknown entity known as SGF Secretaries, PTY Limited, with anonymous shareholders, with their chartered accountants being the front and being the nominated sort of uh, directors. I couldn't find out who those directors and shareholders really were. But uh, I, fortunately, they said I wasn't allowed to copy them, but I interpreted that to mean it didn't mean I couldn't photograph that, that document. And it was that document which caused Bazooka Khadebe, who was by that, at that stage, was still on the Zolko. He was pro-mining. When we showed it to him and other leaders in the community, Scorpion de Mane, they, that was empowering to them. They now had information that they, and they realized they were being led by the nose and they took issue with it. Both Scorpion de Mane died very soon, a couple of months thereafter, a suspected poisoning, and Bazooka Khadebe was shot in 2016. So the point I want to make when we talk of empowerment, what we need is the rule of law. We need to have prosecutions. We need to ensure that criminality doesn't run riot because communities will then seek to take law into their own hands to protect themselves. So I wanted to just give that context to say that what's now exciting for me is, okay, we first got the right to free, prior, and informed consent. We now have got people the right to access to information so they can know what they're consenting to. And the last point I want to make is our next conversation is going to be about the media. Because on the Tolobeni story, it is a narrative of how the, the media were critical in terms of access to information, freedom of expression. And um, I will send everybody that interested a submission I made to the uh, Satchwell Committee on Media Ethics. Because what's really concerning me is how the media has been eviscerated, hollowed out, it's fighting with each other, and that the vital institution that I can't that I need as a social worker to do my job has been so com compromised in the last five years. Notwithstanding, we still achieved this victory. So I just wanted to signal that for anybody who's watching this to say the next one's going to be with people in the media industry to help us more. But anyway, Richard, do you want to quickly comment on that and share some of that early historical experience? Because that is one of the most important aspects of empowerment is historical memory and people knowing their narratives and their stories. Well, I'm not very good at storytelling, but um, what I can say is that if, if we work with a community, you know, if you can't persuade that community that we've got a battle and we've got a chance of winning it and we can actually achieve something. In other words, if you can't persuade people that they're strong, and if you can't persuade people that they're powerful and have the ability to change their circumstances and direct the outcomes of their lives, um, you have nothing. People will capitulate, people will sell out, people will walk away. People need to feel that they are agents, that they have agency and they have power. You lose that, you have nothing. You cannot fight. You just have, you have people who crawl before their leaders and beg for handouts. Um, these struggles, as you've seen at Kolobeni, they can only be built where the community believes in itself and has confidence in its ability to direct and shape its future. And that's what we're missing in South Africa. People just don't believe that they have the ability to, to take control of their lives and shape their own destiny. Um, if we can do that, um, we can change the rest of this country um, the, way, the way the people of Tolobeni have changed their fate and have taken control over their futures. And that's all for the better. Thank you. Tuniko, I want to invite you to say something, because as a theologian, perhaps, because I mean, the church, you and I have had a context where the faith-based faith organizations have been critical in successful struggles around the world in that empowerment process. Any thoughts? Yeah, look, I think one of, you know, one of my, my um, uh, dilemmas uh, intellectually at the moment is to try and understand what really is going on in the country in the sense that, well, 
we know the South African Council of Churches um, and similar NGOs have become uh, severely weakened over the years. Uh, over the past few years, many NGOs have uh, basically abdicated and handed over their agency, to quote uh, my, my colleague, to, to, to government and representatives of government. And, 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 and that is as true of, of the, and the, the South African Council of Churches is just one example of faith-based organizations that have become em emaciated and much more uh, powerless than they've been before. And what, the, here is my dilemma. My dilemma is this, that, you know, in this, in this scenario where your, your, your NGOs and um, civil society organizations appear weakened, at best, and at other times they are at sixes and sevens, and that they too become recipients of patronage that um, was referred to earlier. They are not, they are not exempt from being patronized themselves, um, and that complicates it even, even, even more. So, we have, we have in this country, I'm told, a protest. Um, at, at least one protest per day, if not more, uh, barring the lockdown, because the lockdown was very effective in, uh, in, in stopping all of that. But in our normal selves as a country, uh, Somadu has said we are uh, vociferous, noisy, uh, but we are also a, a protest nation in that sense. We protest a lot. But I am not sure that we protest correctly, that we protest enough. Um, so there is a sense in which our protests have become disconnected and um, lo local based as it were. So people will protest about the, the local road in Richards Bay, others will protest about the local uh, school latrines in Limpopo and, and so on and it goes on but there is not a coherent civil society agentic um, thrust of, uh, of, of, of seeking change uh, as it were and so Colin Scorza dies and Nathaniel Julius uh, is killed um, and I can add on you have clicks and then um, all you have are your EFF um, uh, uh, radicals who, who, who engage in some action and push around the very women who are supposed to be uh, the subject of insult in, in, in this clicks thing. And so I, I, have, I have a sense that the civil society voice in South Africa is greatly diminished and where it where it, it it exists, it is incoherent and unable to um, to to make an impact. And the South African Council of Churches is is uh, is, is no different. It is in that realm of things. But one hopes that we will um, reach a stage, uh, and maybe there are signs that uh, we are going there. I mean, it took George Floyd in the U.S for us to talk about Collins Causa uh, and for our leaders to talk about Collins Causa. And um, this click saga um, contrast the violent interventions of the EFF with the absolute silence of government almost in my view. And we are caught in between this. And so, do you speak up against the EFF violence or do you speak up against the silence of government? And how do you speak up against the one and not the other, uh, as it were? And how do you speak up against the, 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 the gender insensitivity of the EFF? I mean, you were referring to their engagement with uh, Tulima Donsela, um, advocate Tulima Donsela which was uh, shameful. I mean, it had nothing to do, I mean, clicks was probably 
smiling and wondering what on earth are these people talking about? Because suddenly they were talking about the marriage, the marital status of um, Tulima Donsela and uh, how uh, she's not a real professor. I don't know if um, they realized that they were actually undoing the very, the very protest that they thought uh, they want to, to, to support by attacking a woman on issues that had nothing to do with the, 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 the debate ad hominem, if you like, uh, 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 attacks. So this is, the, this is the state of our protest, as it were. The EFF demonstrates these um, uh, incoherent, this uh, ineffectual, this uh, self, self-incriminating and self-defeating forms of protest that I see all around me. And I do miss the, the, the South African Council of Churches. I do miss the UDF. And it was quite interesting that the UDF um, birthday occurred around uh, the same time that all of, uh, of, of these things uh, was happening. So maybe, maybe new organizations will emerge. I mean, the TAC, for example, um, has been a very important voice in post-apartheid uh, South Africa. Even they, I don't hear much uh, coming from them. Only those organizations which have got the power to litigate seem to be taking prominence. Not so much the organizations that can put feet on the ground, as it were, and, and push for change in government. So I, I, I am worried that we are we have become very tolerant of corruption and very tolerant of, um, of, of uh, mis, uh, misrule, uh, as it were. Yeah. No, John, I, I, I wanted to perhaps just touch on also what Prof Maluleke had indicated, and, and I think it's, it's quite important towards the latter part of his um, um, contribution, that being that the fact that you know, any, any successful measure on behalf of communities has to come through litigation, you know, is an added concern because there aren't many public interest litigators who, who can undertake that sort of work or, you know, NGOs who have the resources to hold the state accountable. Um, so although litigation is in and of itself a form of protest, it is a costly process and it is quite a timely process as well. And in many instances, when you, when 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 the issues that need to be addressed are immediate, you tend to find that they are dragged on um, in courts, and you know, inadvertently, you know, whatever justice would be sought is likely denied owing to such a delay. Um, for me, John, the default position, primarily over the past decade, is that of you know, the, 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 you derogate from constitutional obligations. Um, that being that the governing policy actually amongst the ruling elite is to not give effect um, to the provisions of the document um, that they swore by. So, you know, when, when, when trying to enforce those legislative provisions, you will be, be, be met by opposition, be that in the court or in the streets or et cetera. And that's actually what's, what's, what's been demonstrated as far as I'm concerned. So while protest is is desired in any democratic forum. It's, it's, it's concerning that this is the only language that seems to be audible to you know, the governing elite. Um, and, and when you get decisions like that of Tolo Beni and you, you take into consideration the time that it's taken just to get this particular decision, um, how many other impactful decisions are we then going to have to engage upon as a society in order to have a voice be, be, be before the people that we vote for. So I think we, we also need to start considering manners in which we as ordinary citizens can become effective. Um, and it, 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 it's insufficient, I think, that you have a favorable decision or you have, you know, the court court decision on um, bringing in independence, etc. But it's, it's more a way of, you know, how do we ensure that us as citizens um, have an audible voice and speaking once is sufficient 
um, in order for action to be taken, rather than speaking once, then going to the streets, then being engaged in a court battle in order to have your, your voice heard. So we also have to recognize that the governing policy is that of corruption. Um, and once we are honest with that, then I think we can um, devise methods and, and strategies in order to engage this particular ill and ensure that the elected officials are custodians of our, of our constitution. Mm. Well said, thank you. So my daughter. Mm. In fact, I think, uh, let me start with a very fundamentally important point that our colleague, the lawyer from Pumalanga, if you look at South African history, you'll note something very interesting. Each epoch where there have been critical changes tilting the scales towards our advancement towards social justice, that's when you have had mass action involved. In other words, where you have had mass participation by the masses of the people. But the moment you have seen a regression, it's when leaders are left alone to design the future on behalf of the people. Take, for example, the mass defiance campaigns of the 1950s. They gave us the Freedom Charter. Take again the Black Consciousness Movement of the 1970s. They gave us all your Black Management Forum, the Black Lawyers Forum, and many other forums and community uh, projects and so forth, and reignited the society. Take the mass democratic movement where UDF, Kosato, and others were involved in the 80s. The biggest cardinal error made during negotiations was to translate that into an elite coalition arrangement and demobilize mass participation of people. During that very same period, all the progressive media NGOs that were funded by global community, the funding was withdrawn because now it was going to be directed to government. And what are we left with today? It's a small NGO community, which is mainly for litigation, and also a small very determined, intense community of violent protests. And those are the extremes. It is for that reason that HSRC had produced another article which said, the fire that calls, where they were saying, only when something is burning does government officials, other people respond. And that becomes a positive reinforcement, especially in a weak state, especially where you have weak capacity of state. That same violent tendency has forced itself into the branches of organizations like the ANC, the EFF, into the student politics and so forth. If you can organize intensely violence, you're bound to rise to some leadership level and so forth. Then you can imagine if the University of Life where we graduate leaders is through those means. But it is also a testimony to the legitimacy crisis of the established institutions of politics. Hence, you have more than 50% not even bothering to participate in elections, even though they are eligible to vote. It tells you that there is a legitimacy crisis there. So we must then, when we try to reconnect all these missing links, understand this legitimacy crisis of politics, understand the character, the nature of these violent you know, tendencies, which most of them are actually not even following any law. We have become a society where lawlessness and anarchy often masquerade as vibrancy of democracy. But also access to justice, I raised this with the Chief Justice uh, one time when we had a debate to say access to justice is very expensive in this country. 
All you have to do is to steal 100 million, you spend another 10 million on lawyers, then you can keep justice at bay. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask Sikamo to just check out? You said you needed to leave early, um, but thank you so much, Sumpatola. I've got a hobby horse in the stable that I want to kind of give it a gallop, um, but I'll do that to end things off. But Sikamo, do you want to do you want to say something in closing? Um, no, no, John. I mean, I, I have nothing to say in closing other than, you know, thank you for, for, for having me as part of this, this forum again. Um, and I look forward to actually receiving the recording just to see what I've missed, of course. Thank you. So thank I, I'm you, thank you, very everyone. grateful to you. Have a good day. Richard, yourself? Um, no, just to thank you. I mean, I, I feel really honored to have people like Professor Somadora Fikeni here um, and, 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 and Professor Maluleke. Um, it's a great honor. Thank you very much. It was wonderful to listen to you. Thank you. Good. So I want to thank you um, and maybe just give each of you who left just some last words. Those of us with big mouths, you know, two of my last opinion pieces, one of them was that was suggesting that we don't have a national democratic revolution to talk about. What we have is a national corruption revolution. Uh, and, and that we need to understand the the workings of that corruption revolution that's coming that's going on somebody once said when i went to the union buildings for a, i think it was the national orders uh, a few years back said how did you crack an invite here because you have nothing good to say about our president uh, why did they still how did they still invite you <laughs> you know so I, I i had a sense that we were in spite of it all we're, we're still tolerant uh, that people who have opinions, a different take, were, were allowed to speak. Now, I've always been worried that we may reach a stage where uh, there will be some kind of sanctions against people who speak out. Uh, and maybe we all of us have suffered those sanctions in different ways, uh, because there, there's always a way of getting back at you. And, and I'm sure that I may not have realized uh, why I didn't uh, um, uh, manage to do A and B. And it probably has to do with my, my big mouth. But uh, fortunately, I haven't reached a stage where I have been asked to pay <laughs> or, or anything. But, so, so, but I, I, I hope that we don't really go there because once we go into that stage, <clears throat> the next thing is assassinations uh, of, of people. We have seen it happen in many, many countries where people just disappear. And all you remember is that this person uh, has been having opinions that are contrary, uh, has been a, descending, a dissenting voice, as it were. Um, so my hope is that at least there will be space, if not for ordinary South Africans to speak out, uh, at least for, for the so-called elite who hold uh, contrarian views. Uh, to speak out without intimidation. And the same goes for journalists. Uh, you know, the stuff that we see happening in Zimbabwe, one hopes it doesn't come here. Uh, but with all the killings that one uh, was referring to earlier in, in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, one is not sure that we are completely safe uh, from, 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 from that. And, and if we slide in that direction, then we will have to be very afraid about uh, the future of this country because at least the least we can do at, at the moment is to be able to talk about what's going wrong and to voice our opinions without fear uh, as, uh, as, as, as thinkers, as citizens and as ordinary South Africans. Well, you've been a huge influence in emboldening me to speak my voice too. So thank you, Tanyiko. Um, all I want to say is, again, to thank you for providing this uh, forum and this opportunity. You might think that this is a drop in an ocean, as Mother Teresa once said. But without these drops, the ocean is far less than it, what, uh, it ought to be. I just want to say, when we have this discourse with a degree of civility, agreeing to agree, agreeing to disagree, these are the nuggets that form, or the quilts that form the quilted blanket of our democracy. And uh, 
to me, the most important thing, as Franz Fanon once said in the book, The Wretched of the Earth, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. What is the mission of our time? What must we be doing in face of all the array of challenges? And what opportunities should emerge out of COVID-19 such that future generations will see this cohort of leadership of uh, opinion makers as having tried? And again, one thing I want to say, Prof. Malulege, is I tend to be wary of the South African exceptionalism. We once said this and that won't happen to us. And that disallowed us from analyzing how neo-colonial or post-colonial states, uh, you know, behaved. I'm very happy that you have raised that issue of saying we hope, but beyond hope we should be saying we must analyze the trends, we must analyze the possible scenarios, we must be prepared. Because in my own study, when I was doing master's studying exile and return of Swapo in Namibia back in 1992, I discovered that on average liberation organizations ride on the aura of being the liberators. That particular phase lasts for two decades. But when it is exhausted, it will depend on them performing or them using authoritarian means to sustain themselves. So that in itself, I think to me, we started seeing some of the tendencies as the patrimonial state was beginning to emerge. We started seeing the use of conspiracy theories and so forth in order to nullify certain people and so forth. We started seeing the appropriation of liberation, uh, you know, uh, rhetoric and so forth. So we should speak against that. If as public opinion makers that puts us at risk, we should always remember that every social justice project, whether on gender, on race or anything, it has always had its inherent risks. That's why Steve Bigo says, it's better to die for an idea that shall live than to live for an idea that will die. So to me, this courage of conviction is very important in any event, human beings have a very short lifespan. They'll live and die. But it would be better to say, I lived and died for something. And awakening the masses of the people to participate. And also having the terms of engagement that have civility and mutual respect in it becomes very, very important. Bring agency to the people not leave it to the elite, but let us be honest in our difficult conversation because we've deployed terms such as the rainbow nation. Indeed, the rainbow nation could be an aspiration of us being united at a certain point. But if we give ourselves that honor, we are behaving like a marriage where you are given a certificate before you perform instead of a qualification in a college where you first perform before you are given a certificate. Where we say we aspire to be a rainbow nation, what must we do to get there? Thank you. Thank you, Zomorul. It just occurs to me that I heard you at the giving a tribute to King Mpondobini Zikal in 2013 at his funeral. So it was in the context of a death that you had something to teach me, and I'm just so grateful that Life has come out of that relationship. So thank you for that. Really, there's not enough time for, um, for these discussions. This has felt actually really short. But for me, kind of my parting 
hope is that more South Africans will wake up to how actually our communitarian spirit has been exploited. So it used to be that, you know, it used to be that people say, umundu, umundu, ngabandu, but now it's actually more the reverse, that people think that abandu, abandu, ngomundu. In other words, instead of saying I am because of the community, you have more and more elites who think the community is because of me. Um, and you see that reflected in the kind of policies that we have as well, which are in effect saying that we must be content with saying, it's fine if I'm not eating, as long as the people who are eating have the same skin color as me. And I think it's, 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 um, it's terrible that we have disempowered the average African in that way to focus on the empowerment of elites as opposed to the empowerment of the ordinary South African. And so that's really what I want to work towards is an idea of, of redress, of transformation that actually looks at the material conditions of every South African as opposed to the material conditions of, of elites. And I think it's only in, in doing that that we will be able to give agency uh, back to people as opposed to agency only for those who are their elected leaders. Thank you.